tsetse flies are a serious threat to the peoples of Africa and their domestic animals. They transmit the tryptnosomes that cause sleeping sickness in man and debilitating killing diseases of cattle, horses and camels. Trypanosomes are microscopic blood parasites transmitted from one host to another by tsetse flies when they feed on the blood of infected animals, including man. Ever since the diseases caused by trypanosomes were recognised at the turn of this century, many methods have been tried to control the spread of the disease. Until a few years ago, large areas of vegetation that formed the habitat of the tsetse fly were cleared. Fences were built to keep cattle away from the wild animals that act as reservoir hosts of trypnosomes. And sometimes the wild animals were just killed. <laughs> For many years it's been possible to protect cattle by chemotherapy. But frequent underdosing has resulted in a serious increase in drug resistance. Fixed-wing aircraft and helicopters were used to spray residual insecticides over Tsetse bush. But the standard crop spraying methods were ineffective and caused serious contamination of the environment. But light aircraft are now being used very successfully in several parts of Africa. Very fine droplets of pyrethroids or endosulfan are distributed by micronair rotary atomizers attached to the fuselage. Spraying takes place at night and early morning, when there's temperature inversion, and when the flies are resting. All the operations are carefully planned and monitored so that the whole area is covered. Spraying from the ground of the flies' resting places on tree trunks and branches is also used. Spraying is effective if carefully managed, but it must be done regularly, and it costs foreign currency that Africa can't afford. So, what are the alternatives? Tsetse flies breed very slowly. The female produces a single larva every nine days or so, unlike most flies which lay large numbers of eggs. Because tsetse breed so slowly, it's possible to control them by removing only a small proportion of the population each day. This was realised as long ago as the early years of this century by a Portuguese estate manager on the island of Principe off the west coast of Africa. He noticed that his field workers were being bitten on their backs by the tsetse. So he provided his workers with dark coloured jackets, the backs of which were smeared with a sticky resin. These sticky patches trapped large numbers of tsetse and greatly reduced their biting nuisance. And combined with other methods, Tsetse were eventually eradicated from the island. The sticky cloth was possibly the very first Tsetse trap. In later years, many different types of traps were designed and used. Most of them were cumbersome, and as we now know, not very efficient at catching Tsetse flies. Nevertheless, some successes were achieved, particularly for the control of tsetse populations living in the vegetation fringing rivers and streams. The invention of the light and easily transported biconical trap in the 1970s resulted in a renewed interest in the use of traps for control purposes, rather than for just population sampling. Research has indicated the best colours and shapes of traps for all tsetse species of major economic importance, and improvements are regularly being made. Tsetse are attracted to a simple black cloth target, especially if it moves in the wind, and if the target is impregnated with insecticide, it kills the tsetse which land on it. Experiments have been conducted on small islands in Lake Kariba, Zimbabwe. Islands formed from hilltops when the Kariba Dam was built. This one, Pimple Island, is six kilometres from the shore, and setsi flies from the mainland cannot reach it unless they hitch a ride on a boat. Likewise, flies released there can't reach the mainland, so it's an ideal place for studying them. Clean, 
uninfected flies are bred at the Tsetse Research Laboratory at Langford near Bristol in England. They're kept in mesh cages and are fed through a membrane on pig's blood from the slaughterhouse. The cages are stored on trays on sloping racks where they produce their larvae which wriggle through the mesh. They roll down the sloping tray into sand where they soon pupate and are collected daily. The pupae are packed for dispatch to Africa by airmail. In Africa, the flies are hatched, and in some experiments before they're released, each one is color-coded with spots of colored paint. Using nine colors in pairs at 14 positions on the thorax of the fly, Upwards of 25,000 individuals can be coded and identified. This method was published in 1953. The four central positions represent hundreds, and the ten peripheral positions, tens and units. On any date, two colours are used, of which two spots of the first colour and one of the second are applied. The two spots of the same colour indicate hundreds and tens, and the second colour indicates units. In this way, every individual fly released in Africa can be identified. On Pimple Island, there are three oxen to provide food for the flies, plus a small team to look after the animals and to help the scientist set up and run his experiments. Three times a day, an ox is taken on its fly round, stopping at a series of locations for five minutes. The flies that come to feed on the animal can be observed and identified. Setsi locate their hosts by scent as well as by sight, and the effectiveness of targets and traps is dramatically increased by placing an attractive scent in their vicinity. <laughs> 